Does that feel any better? All right, welcome back. Um, yeah, it doesn't flicker as much anymore. So yeah, let's just I think it's, stick I think with it's that. the external camera that I have here. Okay. Um, all right, then it's also time um, to kick it off. Um, welcome everybody um, to uh, to this Ask an Expert session. Um, my name is Teresa Lieb. I'm a food systems analyst here at Greenbiz, and I'm really excited to be here today with um, Eric Larson. Um, you already know Eric from our um, keynote um, session earlier today. He's a senior research researcher at Princeton University, and he co-leads um, Princeton's Net Zero America study. So um, you probably, maybe you've joined a, an Ask an Expert session yesterday already or in one of our other conferences, um, but the main focus of these conversations is to open up um, the, the conversation to our audience. You can chime in with questions either in the chat um, function or in the Q&A function, or you can also come um, join us on the screen. And um, Lina already posted some instructions on, on the right-hand side on how to do that. Um, so let's kick it off. Um, Eric, maybe it would be helpful if you just, um, for the people who missed your keynote earlier today, um, quickly introduce, introduce yourself, um, tell us why you're here um, and what the main focus of your work is. Sure, um, yep, um, so I'm Eric Larson. I'm a senior research faculty member at the Anlinger Center for Energy and the Environment at Princeton University. Um, our, our center is a, a sort of a non-traditional one in that we work on very applied problems. Um, and I've spent my career working on energy challenges associated with climate change. Um, and, and most recently I co-led a large, it was a two-year study, 18 researchers, uh, both at Princeton and elsewhere, to, to um, really paint a picture of what it would look like to get to net zero emissions for the United States by 2050. And uh, the report came out uh, uh, in December of 2020, um, and it's gotten a tremendous amount of attention. And I, and I think the main reason for that is that we, we went into very high resolution um, ge geospatially and temporally and sectorally to describe what it would look like to, uh, to, for the country to travel from where we are today to an energy system or an economy wide that is net zero emissions. Um, and so that's what my keynote talk was about, was a high level summary of, of that work. Um, and we've been speaking with I was just telling Teresa before we got on here, I, I, we've been speaking with many people in all across the, the country, both in government, in the private sector, in non-governmental organizations. There's been a great deal of interest in, in understanding what, what is in our report. We have a 350 page PowerPoint slide report, which you're, uh, you can access um, and, and see all the, all the gory details. That is quite impressive. Um, well, thank you so much for, first of all, for doing this work. I think that will be really helpful, not only for policymakers, but also for, you know, corporations, um, companies, big and small in, in the U.S. to see where to really focus their efforts on. Um, so I'm curious, in your keynote, you were also talking about the need um, for a moonshot-like um, mission-driven driven public-private pa partnerships to really make headway on this work. Um, do you have any good examples um, that you're already seeing now in this space, or is that something that's really just like starting to happen? Um, there's a lot of activity. There's The awareness has gotten much um, greater than it just in the short period of time, I think, um, with the change in administration um, it's it's sort of led to a lot of people beginning to be active, but I but there hasn't been, I would say, sort of the coordinated level of effort that would be the equivalent of a moonshot um, kind of activity. Um, but you know the gears are starting to turn. I think so. I'm optimistic that that um, you know there's going to be a lot more. This this activity is going to be ramping up over over time. Which it needs to do, as, uh, as I suggested in the in the talk. Yeah, and how do you kind of like see your own role um, in 
um, in scaling scaling that work? Do you think you're going to be actively involved going forward, or um, are you going to be focused on new research projects? Um, well, my my career I've, I've spent on re I've doing research. I've been at Princeton for longer than I want to admit, um, and it's always been doing research. But the research has been always aimed at at informing policy and and private uh, investment decisions. So I'm I'm very conscious in my work of of uh, doing work that's going to be useful in in you know the relatively near term. I'm not looking to solve um, the great mystery that's going to come out with a new a new idea a hundred years from now. Um, I want to see actions coming out of my my work, and so the so I'll be continuing to do this kind of analysis um, that helps inform the discussions that are going on around the country. Uh, and actually around the world, we're, we're kicking off net zero projects in other countries as well. Yeah. Um, okay. Do you, um, are you talking to researchers in, in other countries as well to kind of like do the sim similar kind of like very granular analysis um, for, for other economies or how do you, how do you think about the global yeah. connections? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. What well, that's um, we've we've already um, helped get a, a net zero Australia project off the ground, um, and the idea is that different countries have very different circumstances and and resource bases and and um, you know uh, governing structures, um, and so it's really important to do this kind of analysis in in local um, regions in order to really understand what what the possibilities are and what the challenges are locally. So we, we, the project in Australia has gotten started. We've, we've talked with folks in Thailand, in Chile. Um, we, I've had a longstanding collaboration with folks in China. Um, we'll see where, where, where uh, analysis goes there. But yeah, I think um, this, this kind of work can be really sort of eye-opening, I think, in, in terms of what the challenges are and what the opportunities are. Yeah. Um, okay. In terms of um, local challenges, um, one of the one of the big pieces of your work was also um, looking at the job transition and at how how a net zero America can be equitable for everybody in the country. Um, can you maybe uh, you know summarize your or your key takeaways from that and and your recommendations for how companies and and other people in our audience here um, can can support that kind of work? Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, yeah, we modeled we modeled the jobs that would go with the transition, um, both um, the types of jobs, you know, which which sectors of the economy. Um, as well as where those jobs would be under the assumption that the patterns of employment today are reflected in in the patterns in the future. So that's a, that's a pretty big assumption. But for example, where there are wind turbine manufacturing facilities today, we assume that, that those would be where they are in the future. Um, and what we found overall for employment was that there's a lot more jobs um, when we go to the net zero transition, um, largely because of so how distributed solar and wind uh, technologies are. Um, but there are also job losses that will happen where fossil fuel uh, industries are, are declining, which they will in a, in a net zero economy. There's still quite an active oil and gas industry in our, in most of our scenarios by 2050, but, but, um, uh, much reduced in size from what it is today. And so places where those jobs are, uh, where the number of jobs are diminishing, um, we can, those can be anticipated and the local states um, involved can, for example, uh, and try to put incentives out to attract the industries that are of the future. So wind or solar and such. Um, so that's, that's what the way we see our study in the employment area being useful is that we can identify areas where there the, it looks like if we don't do something actively we're going to end up uh, losing employment and that's not good for the for those local communities and that's going to potentially create resistance to the change as well so 
um, we can potentially do something about that by anticipating it. Yeah. Um, and so what, what are the opportunities for um, the areas in which you project um, there is a net loss in jobs? Do you feel like um, it's more about a redistribution of um, some of the stronger green economy sectors we're already seeing now or focusing and focusing on kind of like innovation hubs for technologies that we need to see more of in the future? I th I th we haven't done a, a detailed study on that, um, but I but I think there, there could be different situations for different regions, right? So for example, in the Gulf Coast, Louisiana Gulf Coast area is one area where we see in the later part of this transition in the 2030s and 2040s, the oil and gas industry is declining there and there'll be a potentially be a loss of jobs there. Um, on the other hand, we also see that part of the country as a critical component of a CO2 capture and storage industry that, that we think needs to develop um, in order to to meet a net zero goal, and and so the skills of a of the oil and gas industry, a lot of those are transferable to um, a CO2 transport and storage industry. You're putting carbon into the ground instead of taking it out of the ground. Um, so by designing um, de designing to uh, the state's policies to attract those industries. Um, to be established in Louisiana, for example, could help maintain jobs there. That's that's one one example. In another another case, uh, might be in Appalachia, where where coal mining would, is is going to be on the decline. It already is on the decline, but there it might be that um, the idea of and uh, potentially attracting manufacturing facilities, for example, for either wind turbines or solar panels or electric vehicles or other sort of industries of the future, um, that might be a strategy to be taken in a place like that. Mm -hmm. And are you already seeing um, local policymakers and communities um, taking you up on some, some of these ideas? Um, I've, I've actually been talking to folks in the Louisiana government um, about the idea of, of CO2 capture and storage um, industry developing there, and they're very um, interested in understanding that and doing their own analysis as well. So yes, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and and I guess like one one big um, factor that comes in there is like how to finance um, those transitions and those new new sectors, and that's one of the big risks that you pointed out. Um, what's been the response from the from the finance sector to to the report? Well, we've had uh, we've given a, a bunch of briefings to uh, investment houses um, who are trying to understand, you know, where where they should be putting their money in the in the in the longer term. Um, the I think ultimately the it'll be a combination of 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 government um, incentives or or proddings, if you will, that that will help to de-risk. The in, some of the investments um, so, so that it'll encourage more investment than would otherwise happen. Um, but again, the, 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 what we've done hasn't been, um, we haven't modeled any of the mechanisms that might be put into place to do something like that. We've only identified that we need to raise a lot of, of capital uh, and deploy a lot of capital in order to be on this transition path. So to some extent we're we're leaving it to others who think about those things a lot more deeply than we are capable of thinking to come up with solutions yeah yeah fair enough um okay so we have um two questions coming in from the audience let's look at the first one um does your model have any substantial divergence from the iea's new net zero pathway um have you have you looked into that so that I presume that's the, the the global net zero study that came out relatively recently. Um, I haven't studied the details of the of the U.S. part of that study to compare it with our model. Um, I would I would comment that the 
the goal of I think in that in that study um, net zero by 2050 for the world was the was was what the study was uh, suggesting would be achieved, um, and that to me to, to me given the the magnitude of the challenge for the United States that that is apparent from our work, um, and the U.S. is perhaps the best endowed country in terms of natural resources and um, financial capability and technical capability to get to net zero, um, to have the whole world uh, where an, more than half the population is still low on the economic develop, relatively low on the economic development ladder. I think that's a bit of a stretch to, to get the whole world to, to, to net zero by 2050. That means the U.S. would have to be going even faster than what we painted in, in the picture that we painted in our study. Um, so I haven't, I haven't looked at the IEA study carefully enough to, to give you a detailed um, response on that. But um, um, yeah, there, it's, it, the global challenge is even bigger than the US challenge, I would say. Yeah, yeah, that is a good point. And I do think, you know, like if countries like like the US or I'm from Germany, if, if countries like the US and Germany don't uh, succeed at making this transition, it's really hard to, um, you know, ask other less endowed countries to, to do the same. And then also looking at historic emissions, which is something that I'm not sure if you accounted for um, in the report um, about, you know, like, um, developed countries having a, a more historic responsibility to mitigate climate change um, and taking that into into account when when deciding on on future pathways as well yeah we didn't we didn't explicitly consider that um, but the the one the one sort of um, thing that one could think about in the global context is that um, it's not it's not just a single country that that contributes to decarbonizing um, it contributes to de decarbonizing itself but it also contributes to the to the world in the sense that technology that gets developed in one country can help um, you know accelerate the transition in other countries so I you know I thank Germany for buying so many solar cells over the years because that really helped drive the cost of solar down and now the whole world can benefit from that. Um, so the similar kinds of things could happen in the U.S. where we invest in technologies beyond solar and wind that that need to come down in cost in order for other countries to be able to 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 adopt them. Um, things like carbon capture and storage, for example, um, that could be a, a way that the U.S. transition really helps accelerate transitions elsewhere as well. Yeah, yeah, that is a good point. Somebody has to start driving down cost. And uh, we we have another question um, thinking about, okay, well, this all seems like really logical and makes sense to to people looking at the data. But how do how do politics play play into all of that and, and polarization in the US? Are you worried about that? Um, certainly, you know, polarization is not not going to be helpful. Um, and it can't be modeled <laughs> the way yeah. the way we model things. Um, so, you know, I, I I think the the you know the the common sort of the way I finished my keynote talk was say that was to say that we needed to come together regardless of our political views or or other uh, views on other topics, but there needs there needs to be a sort of a common agreement that we do need to do something about climate change. We need to, to get to net zero. Um, and if we have that common objective, then there's going to be differences among stakeholders in how to achieve that. Um, and we showed five diff very different pathways um, for, for getting to net zero. Some of those pathways, some, some stakeholders may not like, others may like, just like other ones, but we have to get as a as a as a country, we have to be able to keep, stay focused on the goal of net zero and work through our differences um, to get you know to to establish the the main the means for getting there. Hmm. Yeah, and and um, have you have you developed also um, 
you know, different policy or economic pathways to help the country get on get on this pathway that that you point out? Or have you? Uh, yeah, we're not. No. We, we we purposely avoided um, sort of recommending any specific policies, just mm -hmm. because there's many different ways to to um, you know um, to approach policy, um, and we thought the, the the and we're not we're not policy experts, um, and so we thought the best thing that we could do in terms of contributing to the conversation is to just paint as clear a picture of what would be required. If we want to get to net zero, these are the things that we have to see happening in our country, and then leave it to the policymakers to to figure out um, how to make those actually happen. Okay. Um, all right. Let's let's keep moving um, with the question. Um, someone asks Rohit Vidara, we don't talk about the carbon cycle enough. Um, do you think that we need to address natural flows such as decomposition even more so? Um, and who specifically cares or works on this area? Um, so I, I guess that refers to um, um, sort of non-CO2 emissions of greenhouse gases maybe um, and or um, carbon sinks so that, that are natural carbon sinks like growing mm -hmm. trees and changing farming practices to, um, to incorporate more carbon into the soil over time to reduce emission, reduce carbon in the atmosphere. Um, those in our modeling, we, we didn't model those two elements specifically, but, but they were two of the six pillars that I discussed in the keynote the reduction of non-CO2 emissions and enhancing the land sinks. And those are, there's significant potential there um, in both cases. And it's really quite important to, that we be pursuing those in the same time we're pursuing solar and wind and other uh, low carbon options on the energy system. Um, yeah, so those are, those are important, no question. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> have you have you looked at also um, emissions from from agriculture, like directly um, from on farm emissions and and emissions from land use change, um, and how that plays plays into um, into the the models? Yeah, so we uh, so we made an assumption about uh, what what the emissions from agriculture would look like over time, and those were those assumptions then set the um, set the target for what the energy system had to achieve, right? So if, if non-CO2 emissions um, are reduced by a certain amount, but not all the way, that, that then the energy system has to uh, make up the difference somehow. Um, so we, we use the Environmental Protection Agency's um, estimates of what could be achieved in terms of reducing agricultural and other non-CO2 emissions. Um, and we end up re reducing maybe 20 to 30% compared to where we are today. So, uh, whereas if we didn't do anything, we would be increasing from today. So we're actually compared to compared to um, where it might might end up in in 2050. If we don't do anything, we're, we're probably on the order of 50 to 60% below that that level. Um, so that's on the non-CO2 side. Um, and then in terms of land use change, we, again, we didn't uh, incorporate anything explicitly, but we did make an assumption about the land sink uh, in total. So, which could include planting trees, for example, in, in some places to increase uh, carbon uptake into trees. Uh, but we didn't, we didn't go into details on that, although we did, You'll see we have, um, I think, 18 or 20 different annexes that that in, on on different topics that support our work, our full report, and one of those is on um, the potential. Two of those, one uh, is on the potential of um, enhancing land sinks, one in agriculture, and the other in the on the forestry side. So there's a lot more detail there for those who are interested. Mm -hmm. And and why is that 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 wasn't um, a big focus area of the report? Because if you look at kind of like global um, 
global emissions, um, agriculture and land use change specifically um, has such a big impact on on, on emissions. Um, is it is that not the same in the U.S. or it just relates differently to the work that you you were trying to do? Um, yeah, it's it's yes to both of those um, questions. The so in the one the one area where we did sort of address land use change was one of the important resources in our modeling was biomass uh, or plant matter as an energy source. Um, mm -hmm. And we're very well aware of the, the um, fact that there would potentially a fuel versus food conflict if we convert land from agricultural production to energy production. So we made the explicit um, um, constraint in the model that we would not allow that kind of land use change. So that limited the amount of biomass that we could use for, for energy. Um, but that's that was important in addressing the sort of making sure that we weren't going to create other problems by solving solving the climate problem. Um, and and the other um, the other part of the the answer was that in, it's difficult to model in the same fashion that we modeled um, the energy system. It's difficult to model the biological system in the same sort of um, objective kind of way. Um, and so that we felt that our time was better spent to make an explicit and transparent assumption about what happens uh, on those on the biological side of things and then stick to modeling the energy system itself subject to the constraints um, that come with the assumption about the um, the biological system. Mm -hmm. um, and then we have one kind of technical question asking, how did um, you account for industries that have a wide range of errors such as landfills in, in your modeling? Um, so the, the, I guess with landfills, again, that's a non, non CO2 emission that would be the main issue in that particular industry. And again, we just um, we adopted um, projections that came out of the Environmental Protection Agency's analysis, it's a very significant analysis to 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 uh, determine what what the level of non CO two emissions would be, um, and that encompasses landfills and and many other industries as well. Okay. Um, and going back to our discussion around um, finance and investment, Candace asks, what was the biggest piece of feedback from the investors about their hesitation for investing? Did they favor independent efforts or initiatives over specific companies? Um, we didn't get into that level of, of discussion with the investors. Um, my, my sense from um, most of the meetings that the, that that they were really trying to understand the technology landscape, um, so as to be able to understand where to you know what technologies are the most promising in term in terms of commercial projects down the road. Um, yeah, so we didn't get into the, that level of detail in the discussion. Um, all right, then let's move on to um, behavior change, um, which is an important um, topic for decarbonization. Um, do you know of any uh, studies um, or best ways for changing society's habits to adopt to new behaviors in the decarbonized world? Um, do you, you know, what's your favorite kind of work in that space? <laughs> yeah, so I'm not a behavioral psychologist. Um, I'll have to start with that caveat, but but I have a, a colleague here at the Anlinger Center, uh, Elke Weber, who is is a behavioral psychologist, and she thinks about these things very deeply about how you change, uh, how we change behavior in society, and it has a lot to do with the norms of society, um, and people tend to follow norms, um, which are you know, norms means just sort of the normal behavior of society. We tend to be pack animals and follow, uh, you know, when, when one group starts doing something a lot, others join in, um, that sort of thing. Um, and so understanding how norms change 
is important and how how one can encourage norms to change and that's something that elke studies and i would encourage people who are interested to read some of her stuff um the other the other um interesting thing i've learned in this process is is that it's not always in changing behavior it's not always the best idea to to go head on at uh the 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 reason that you want to change behavior so so climate change itself that's the reason i want to see people doing things differently and uh but that's not always the most effective argument for changing behavior and there's some interesting work that's been done in australia by a company called called evident um where they were tasked with um um Re figuring out a way to reduce the the agricultural runoff that was killing the Great Barrier Reef, and the the runoff was coming from sugarcane farmers who who were whose practices were not you know sustainable, and this company went in and and basically turned around the sugarcane farmers um, to to much better, much more sustainable practices, and they never once met, mentioned the Great Barrier Reef. And uh, so it's an interesting case study of how you change behavior by finding what really motivates the people whose behavior um, you want to see changing. Uh, and this company was successful in doing that. And so it's an interesting if I had a if I had a career to do again, I might have gone into behavioral psychology, but it's it's way past my time to learn new tricks. So oh, there you always have time to to learn new tricks but yeah it's an area that i find interesting as well and there's a lot of um work on it in the food space like trying to think about how to encourage people to eat more sustainably or or more healthily and and in that area also i think a lot of the research shows that people care more about health than the environmental outcomes um and so you know focusing messaging on how how different more sustainable food or or renewable energy or whatever it is um, has positive health effects that I think often can can be more convincing for people to participate. We actually, we did do um, air quality modeling in our study and the health impacts of the air quality modeling. And, and we, um, our estimate is, is across the, um, across the whole economy, some, something on the order of 200 to 300,000 premature mortalities would be avoided by going to the and that's zero pathway because you eliminate a lot of motor vehicle emissions, you eliminate a lot of fossil fuel power plant emissions, um, and there's good there's good established modeling techniques for understanding what the impacts of that are, and we've got some of that in our report. Hmm. Yeah, and then I assume there's also a lot of indirect um, benefits if I just think about how wildfires in California impact um, air quality for two or three months of the year um, and how, you know, that's going to worsen if we don't get on a net zero pathway. It's quite an important um, area to look at. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, okay, so we have uh, a question from Kermit about um, government involvement in facilitating the pathway to net zero and specifically um, around investing um, into cutting edge technologies um, that might be too risky for the private sector to invest in. Um, do you have thoughts on that? Yeah, certainly. I think that's a, a, a very good point. And in in our in our estimate of the of the costs of the of the capital that needs to be mobilized in this next decade, from 2020 to 2030, we included a $140 billion, I think, um, which would be uh, to support um, the, the maturing of technologies that we don't need today, but we might need to have them as an option in the 2030s and 2040s. Um, and that kind of investment is really, the government really has to play a role in that because there's no return on that investment in the time frames, any sort of reasonable time frame for a company that's that's developing the technology. Um, so I, I think it, I agree that there's a an important role there for for government. And the other the other point to make here is that the the technologies in our modeling are all 
um, technologies that we basically under have an understanding of on from an engineering standpoint today. Um, it would be difficult to create a completely new technology today and have it be deployed at significant enough scale by 2050 to, to have, have an impact just because of the long time it takes to develop technology and then scale it up and deploy it commercially. So we, so we were quite explicit about not assuming sort of a, a silver bullet breakthrough technology, but it would be important for technologies that are not commercially very well established yet, but they are understood. We need to demonstrate those at a significant scale. And that's where this $140 billion we estimated would, would, be, um, would come into the picture. And, and a f some fraction of that should be from government. Mm -hmm. um, do you, where in that categorization of technologies uh, would you say direct air capture falls? Um, is that something that you feel like is well enough developed right now to deploy um, or, it, or is there going to be something else for removing CO2, CO2 from the atmosphere? No, that's, that's one, of the, one of the technologies in that $140 billion bucket um, that, that we should be working on, I think. Uh, and it, it doesn't actually come into our scenarios in, um, in some of them, it, it, it doesn't appear at all. Um, in a couple of them, it it only comes in in the in the late uh, mid to late 2040s, um, and so that's uh, that means we have some time to to develop it, but we need to have it as an option um, in case if we end, if we get to 20 20 35 or 2040 and we see that we're not headed in the direction that lets us get away without using that technology, we'll need to have it as an option uh, available to deploy. So yeah, that's an important technology. Mm -hmm. And then um, thinking about other ways um, for carbon capture and sequestration, um, do you think that growing carbon credit markets or other um, instrument, instruments will be important um, for that or, you know, I, I know you said you you didn't work specifically on policy, but I, I guess people are just like really interested in, you know, how it's actually going to happen. Yeah, yeah. Um, there needs to be a value placed on carbon emissions in some fashion. And I think it's going to be different solutions for different places. Um, I don't think I don't think it's likely that we'll have a universal carbon tax or carbon price. Um, it's more likely that we'll have sector specific um, policies that 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 are not necessarily directly carbon pricing or cap and trade system could be regulations that you know that require best available control technology which is what the EPA uses as a as a standard um, so it's yeah I, I agree that that the carbon has to be valued in order to be able to make the market value it and 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 avoid it. Um, but I think there's it's not clear what the that there's one single solution for for all um, for for getting that done. Yeah. Um, yeah, and I, th I think that's that's true for for a lot of what we talk about here. It always has to be, you know, a bucket of solutions coming together um, to to challenge um, find solutions for these challenges from lots of different um, angles. Um, so we already talked about the jobs a bit earlier, but we have one more question focused on on job and and equity. Um, what level of detail uh, um, have you looked into in terms of the kinds of jobs that will be created or lost? Thinking about blue collar versus white collar or income differences, you know, how, how does it stack up in terms of different uh, labor markets? Yeah, so I don't I don't have numbers off the top of my head, but but in our report we've 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 disaggregated the employment um, by in a number of different dimensions, including things like education level, um, um, you know, sec economic sector construction versus essentially blue collar versus white collar, um, resource sector, you know, solar versus wind versus biomass versus nuclear, for example, um, 
and also wage wage levels um, so and and skill level requirements so we have we've 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 sliced and diced the employment analysis in a lot of different ways that you one can dig into and we we have a website where we we've got all of this data available to download if you want to play with the the numbers yourself um, it was the, the link is netzeroamerica.princeton.edu that was posted in the in the keynote talk. Um, if you just Google Princeton and Net Zero America, you'll find it. Um, so I would encourage people who are really interested in digging into data to, to have a look there. Mm -hmm. um, one big topic over the past year was also how to um, support uh, more racial equity in the US. Is that um, another kind of dimension you looked at in terms of the jobs question? We did not, um, but again, the the idea um, and and a, some follow on work that a, that one of our uh, researchers who was on the project, Erin um, Mayfield, doc, Dr. Erin Mayfield, she is she was a postdoc with us during the project. Now she's going to be starting a faculty position at Dartmouth um, College. Her modeling is is multi. Op, uh, multi-objective optimization um, and within that kind of modeling work one of the factors that can be taken into consideration is is environmental justice considerations um, and and she's interest uh, her her interests in the future are in in modeling that sort of um, that kind of thing so we haven't done it ourselves but that's the level of um, the level of detail and resolution that we have in our modeling is what's needed, I think, to be able to do that kind of work in the future. So we hope that it, we've set a, a starting point for others to carry on, and Aaron will be one of those who's carrying on. Yeah, that that would be great to see. Um, all right, so we're almost out of time. Um, you know, reflecting on all the work that you've done over the past um, two years and, and, and the report and the final version coming out end of August, um, what are you most hopeful about um, for, for upcoming for the next, you know, couple of years? And, uh, you know, maybe, maybe just thinking like one year ahead, what, what would you like the conversation to, to be like? Um, if we invited you back next year to Verge Net Zero? Well, I think that, um, you know, the, the change in the in the um, executive branch of uh, the US government has been a breath of fresh air in terms of addressing climate change. And I think the the initiatives that the Biden administration is is thinking about and, and negotiating now, the, the infrastructure package and so on, um, that's beginning to get at the kind of scale and and ambitiousness that we need uh, from the government. Um, so I'm I'm hopeful that 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 something good will come out of that this process that's going on in Washington right now, and it'll set the standard for how we need to be aggressive and we need to um, really focus on on the objective. As I said, uh, you know, a common focus on the net zero objective. Um, so if I come back in a year and and that has transpired, I will be um, quite happy and optimistic about where we're headed. But um, it's something that we're going to have to keep at um, long term. It's not a one year one year problem to solve. So um, we we have to be in it for the long haul. Yeah, are you hopeful about? Um kind of the upcoming COP in, in the fall and, and global climate negotiations and making progress um, from, from that end as well and putting, putting pressure on national governments or do you feel like that's not going to um, be an important contribution? No, I think, I think everyone around the world is, is starting to really, uh, it's starting to sink home that, that climate change is really happening and, and some countries are going to be hit worse than others and are less capable of managing the the impacts um, the, the US again we're pretty lucky we can we can probably manage the impacts better than a lot of places um, but the fact that that recognition is is spreading I think is gonna encourage um, 
encourage people to to get together and really in a concerted and organized way to, to get something done so i'm hopeful but i've been hopeful before and you know been disappointed but i think we're we're at a point where it's it's almost do or die you know yeah, well, let's hope everybody thinks like you do. Um, okay, we're out of time. Um, thank you so much, Eric, for all the work you've put into the report, um, all your time you've dedicated to um, Verge Net Zero today and in the past um, weeks running up to the conference. We really appreciated you being part of the community and um, hope to, to stay in touch and um, good luck with everything going forward. Great. Thank you very much. And thank you for all the questions from everybody. Of Good course. Yeah. Thanks everybody for the question. And um, we'll see you. We'll see you back here next year. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.